This podcast is intended to provide general information about various recent developments in employment law and human resources best practices. Nothing in this presentation or in the comments of Ms. Johnson, Ms. Shannon, or any guest should be considered as the rendering of legal or other professional advice, and it is not directed at any specific cases or circumstances. Listeners are responsible for obtaining the necessary advice about their specific situations from their own counsel. These materials are intended for educational and informational purposes only. The presentation and these materials represent the opinions of the participants and not those of their law firms or companies. No part of these materials may be printed, photocopied, or otherwise reproduced, recorded, or stored, or transmitted in any form and by any means, electronic, mechanical, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of today's workplace podcast. Welcome to today's workplace, a podcast created to keep employers current on the latest employment law trends while providing proactive solutions to the everyday issues arising in today's rapidly changing workplace. Is your business prepared for today's workplace? Let's find out with your hosts, Barbara Johnson and Belinda Reed Shannon. Hello. During season one of today's workplace, we examined various aspects of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic had on the workplace and employees. This season, we wanted to turn our attention to what some call the second epidemic that impacted our communities last summer after the murder of George Floyd and the period of social justice and racial reconciliation that followed. We saw Americans in cities around the country demand racial equality and consequently, companies everywhere responded by revamping and expanding efforts to address diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organizations. Today, we're very excited to keep the conversation on this topic going with an in-depth discussion on the history and evolution of workplace discrimination and diversity efforts employed in corporate organizations. We are very happy to welcome Grace Spates, partner and head of the employment law practice at the Morgan Lewis Law Firm and former EEOC commissioner, Heifeld Bloom, who now serves as partner and director of workplace culture consulting at the Morgan Lewis Law Firm. Normally we present the bio of our guests at this point, but Grace and Hi have incredibly interesting backgrounds. So we're going to ask them both to indulge us by sharing a little bit of their personal history experience and the work it has all inspired. So Belinda and and Barbara, we are so happy to to join you. Um, And I wanna congratulate you on this wonderful podcast because employers certainly need um, to hear from people like you, Belinda and Barbara, who've been doing this for a long time. So uh, we're happy to join you. So, you know, my journey to to where, you know, I am today in terms of working with employers um, and and, in their workplaces starts way back a long time ago in South Philadelphia. I grew up in South Philadelphia to a single mom at eighth grade. She had eighth grade education and she worked at a factory in South Philadelphia where she sometimes made draperies, other times she bagged draperies, put fiberglass draperies in the plastic bags for sale. Um, And she took me um, to work with her quite a bit, especially on the weekends or days when I was out of school because she didn't have anybody to watch me on those days. Um, And it was just her and me. I'm an only child and she's a single mom. And I went to the factory and I worked in that fiberglass and that stuff was itchy, okay? I came home scratching all the time. It was not a great environment. And looking around and seeing how the workers, including my mom, were treated in the factory, the conditions under which they worked, as a kid, I said, you know, I'm gonna grow up and do something about this, right? And about the only way that I knew to do something about it was maybe a lawyer, because I didn't have any lawyers in my family. I didn't know anybody. But I figured a lawyer, because I'd seen Perry Mason, could do things, right? <laughs> and make things better. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I ended up um, going to, to, to school at University of Pennsylvania, and then came to D.C. for GW Law, and um, did a two-year federal court clerkship. 
and then joined Morgan Lewis. I actually was a summer associate at Morgan Lewis in 1981. And I've been there ever since. <laughs> and the interesting thing, I started out as a general litigator, but I found that boring, all right? Because it was essentially two, two companies fighting against each other over money. We're blessed in that Morgan Lewis has always had a brand employment practice one that's well-known and used by many companies. And I was um, recruited into that group when Title VII was changed to provide for a jury trial, right? Wow. You wonder why. Um. You wonder why. (laughs) All of a sudden, we had clients who said, if I'm sued for a race discrimination case or I'm sued for a gender, it would be great to have a Black woman or Black do this and someone who had jury trial experience. I was in the litigation group, I had it. My labor and employment partners didn't have it. So I transferred and it it changed my life because it was actually, we weren't fight two companies fighting against each other anymore. I was representing management, of course, in, in, in the work that we do, but it provided me an opportunity to also think about the employees and to work with my clients in helping them to make their workplaces better. At that point, we knew nothing about diversity, inclusion, and that kind of stuff, but there was something inside that said, you know, we have to make things better. I started doing employment discrimination class actions, had a couple of huge ones where we didn't really litigate. We mediated from day one, Mm -hmm. and I worked with several large companies in mediating the dispute with their workers and working to change almost every policy within that company so that it wouldn't have an impact, for example, on Black employees, so that the Black employees felt like there was a future. And since doing that, that's how I've developed my practice, and that's my role. And I think that's why people um, and companies seek me out, because I think I, I bring the management side defense, but in a different way, because I'm also thinking about the employees as well. Because that helps my clients, right? Yeah, that's great. That's great. You also have the history and you've seen things yeah. evolve. So I can see where that's valuable. What about you, Hi? So like Grace said, I'm so excited about being here, by the way, with you all and discussing this topic. And it is interesting, I think, that you have two of us here who are sort of different in terms of growing up. I mean, I think a lot of our partners um, probably came from middle income or even higher income families and that's sort of the background and that was certainly not mine. Um, I grew up in quite a poor neighborhood in New York City. Um, My father was a Holocaust survivor, had come here after the war. Um, I grew up in a very sort of insular world. It was an Orthodox Jewish world, Um, but education was so important, which is often the case for immigrant families, right? So education was key. I, like Grace, had never, I hadn't even met a lawyer growing up. I mean, again, that's sort of like a different income class. But I ended up discovering law. I came to DC after college and worked on the Hill. And it was a place where the social justice commitment that I got growing up absolutely found a place in terms of making the world a better place. That was sort of the driving force. So I also had clerkships and then um, worked in DC and was the lead lawyer actually drafting and negotiating the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 on behalf of the disability community. Went from there to Georgetown Law School. I was a professor for 18 years, essentially running a clinic for social justice causes. Catholic Charities USA was a client as well as disability um, groups. And then I got asked by President and the President Obama and the Obama administration to be one of the commissioners of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which was a nice continuation of the work I had done, been working on the with Congress and agencies to to pass laws and, and good regulations. So I went to the EEOC as one of the Democratic commissioners, um, right? It's a bipartisan commission. Um, I've always been a big believer in bipartisanship. I have never, although I've always represented, you know, over the course of my professional career, employees and employee groups, 
Unlike some of my friends, I never thought employers were evil, <laughs> just trying to hurt their employees. Obviously, there are some that are not good and the law needs to be brought against them. But especially at the EOC, I really got focused on preventive work. How could we help employers create good workplaces so they didn't get hit with the charge filed at the EOC? And so when I left the commission after nine years, I decided instead of going back to teaching, I was going to go to a place where I could help employers create what we call safe, respectful, diverse, and inclusive workplaces. And the best place to do that was to go to a respected management law firm that had um, the trust of employers and big companies. And bottom line, the only one I really wanted to go to was the one that Grace Space was at because of literally the work she has done, particularly in this preventive arena, this, this changing culture um, approach, which is what I wanted to do. So that's what brought me here. That's pretty awesome. It is. And once again, welcome to today's workplace. Grace, you told us a little bit about your journey, but tell us a little more about your journey in terms of how you became one of the most sought after experts on workplace discrimination and diversity, and especially in the context of being a black woman in the legal profession, what's been your secret sauce? We're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're talking to someone who has really risen to the top of this profession. So tell us what's been your secret sauce. Well, Barbara, I start with, I think the secret soft starts with being authentic, mm -hmm. um, which is very important. And we have to bring our authentic selves to our workplace for me, that's my law firm, but also to our clients. And one thing that throughout my career, I've always said to clients, especially new clients who come in and, and want to retain me is that um, you may not like the advice that I'm going to give you, okay? Because I'm going to call it the way I see it. Um, and if that's not the kind of advice that you want, uh, then you you have the wrong lawyer and you should go and hire somebody else. That's your, normally my opening thing, especially for investigations, because I know, Barbara, you do a lot of investigations. And a lot of times, you know, there are unfortunately some companies who want to whitewash investigations, mm -hmm. okay? They want you to come in, they want you to say nothing happened here, and then they want you gone and things are resolved. Well, that's not me, okay? And I let people know that up front. I also think that, you know, being a, a black woman, um, we can understand, and I understand why um, black employees or women in the workplace might feel like they have been discriminated against. And a lot of times, you do get into the workplace and you find, no, there wasn't discrimination. But, you know, if, if you have employees who don't feel like they are being treated fairly, and if you're not transparent, their perception becomes their reality. And I think given my life experiences, given that I'm a black woman, given how I was raised with a mom who, you know, worked at the lowest ranks of, 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 of the workforce, that I can come in and assess the situation and say to a client, well, this is why they feel that way. And I can understand why they feel that way because. And so I, I think the, the the authenticity and I think the background and I think the, the just the whole practical advice and assessment that I bring to it has been the reason that, you know, clients have continued to call on me. I think that's such a wonderful response. And I'll just say so often um, employment attorneys depend on that summary judgment, right? We can get the case thrown out on a motion to dismiss or a summary judgment. And I often tell clients, but at the end of the day, there are going to be six people or 12 people or a judge, and they're going to actually decide this case based on fairness. And I think that's the real important takeaway from being able to advise employers on what their real risk and liability is. 
Yeah. For example, Barbara, you know, we often rely on a statute of limitations defense, right? Mm -hmm. Are we going to move to dismiss this? Okay. So you maybe that person, okay, can't bring that claim. But do you really want, you know, to win that case on a statute of limitations problem, but still leave the problem out there in your workplace? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Win that one case, but you haven't changed the culture or the problems. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and hi, I know that you've had such an interesting professional journey as an attorney and thought leader on the topics of workplace discrimination and diversity. Can you tell us a little bit more about how your path has evolved? Well, you know, I want to reinforce what Grace said about authenticity. Because so often a path, I mean, you don't get to choose your path often, right? Lots of things happen. But if you're authentic all the way through, that's going to make a difference. But sometimes it's not so easy to be authentic, right? So for example, with your gender, with your race, at least usually, that's it. People can see it, right? But for example, I'm both a lesbian and I'm a person with a disability but it's not a manifest disability. It's an anxiety disorder that people couldn't see, right? I feel so blessed that in my life, I have been able to literally from the beginning of my professional career, been out about being a lesbian. And perhaps because of working on the ADA and trying to make clear the broad definition of disability includes people who wouldn't think of themselves as disabled. Think about the people with depression or anxiety disorder right. or diabetes. I mean, things that they think it's, you know, someone who uses a wheelchair who is blind or is deaf. Yes, those people have disabilities and it's often like race or gender and it's so obvious and they're stopped at the, at the door of the workplace. But disability can be broader. And again, reinforcing what Grace said, I did an, uh, an investigation um, at Morgan Lewis. Mostly I've been doing, you know, proactive culture change, but I did one investigation dealing with a gay man who felt he was being discriminated against for being gay. It was very clear. Um, I mean, I, you know, it was very clear. There was not discrimination going on here, legal discrimination, but there was an issue in terms of how he felt mm -hmm. and what had gone down in a particular situation that we were able to help the client with just a few changes that they could make um, to allow people actually to be authentic in the workplace. I think uh, that the contribution that you both have made uh, over some really important years of how uh, workplace the workplace has evolved in not only its recognition of but even acceptance of you know these various di and different forms of discrimination that enter the workplace every day and the impact that it has on culture so um this is, we've got some great things to talk about today grace you've represented companies and discrimination claims for a long time now what are some of the most significant changes and or shifts you've seen in the types of discrimination complaints received and what changes, if any, have you seen in terms of the way companies are responding? Yeah, Barbara, I think the biggest changes uh, occurred starting, I guess as we're now four years out um, with the Me Too movement, all right? Um, with with the, those women coming forward, um, it sort of changed both the way I think that companies responded but also empowered women, and I'm gonna talk about others in a minute, to come forward. And so the, we still, you know, obviously have a lot of women who are still afraid to complain um, because of fear of retaliation. But I think we're seeing less of that and we're seeing more people and more women being able to come forward. The whole, you know, bystanders now being trained and encouraged to come forward. So we see bystander complaints, okay? They come forward, say, hey, this is happening. You didn't see a lot of that. At least I didn't see a lot of that pre-Me Too, okay? I saw something, I turned my head, I looked the other way. 
So in addition to victims of, of sexual harassment coming forward, we see bystanders, we see friends, we see people coming forward and, and reporting. Um, shift now to the whole racial justice movement, starting with the, you know, the awful um, killings of, you know, the many people, George Floyd being one. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, we saw a lot on TV of the protest in the street, right? Remember all of the protests? Well, we saw protests and I saw protests inside corporate America, okay? Mm Hi -hmm. and I met with many clients who had employees who are not unionized, non-unionized employees go out on strike, okay? And bringing, being willing to bring forward um, their concerns about racial injustice within companies. In addition, we talked about bystanders with that movement, allies also had came forward. So this is completely different from the employment law work that we were doing um, years ago and over the course of my 37 years. And the one big change, and I know we're gonna talk about this, that we're seeing at least from our clients and, and most of our clients is the focus on culture. Right. We didn't do that years ago. All right. It was we looked at each individual case. We dealt with it. But nobody sat down and said, what's going on with our culture? They just didn't do it. If five, six years ago, I recommended to a client to do a cultural assessment, they would have fired me immediately. (laughs) They would have looked at me and said, why am I going to go out and look for, for problems? Now we are able to encourage and convince many of our clients to do cultural assessments. We turn every rock, we turn every stone, we bring stuff to their attention, but we tell them before we start, you better be committed to making change. Mm -hmm. Because if we do this cultural assessment, we go out and talk to employees and nothing changes, then you're going to have some really big problems. So those are the changes that you know I've seen and I, again I would say it's been over the last four years or so. Yeah. So hi Grace mentioned culture change. And so I'd really like to hear from from your perspective, having worked for so long on the employee side, um, the approach that you then take with these companies in um, you know really helping them to look at it, examine their culture and make the necessary changes. Yeah, so companies, clients, organizations come to us at different at different points. Sometimes they're in crisis. You know, <laughs> they might be in crisis in the newspaper or crisis with their employees, and then you have to help them deal with the immediate crisis. But then you say, "Let's figure out why you got into crisis, right?" In terms of the culture. But we are also having any number of companies and organizations that are not in crisis, but they are being told by their employees that they want to see something different in terms of diversity and inclusion, right? So that's what the request is. And sometimes it's employees and sometimes it's investors or shareholders, right? But there's that pressure. And part of what we have to explain to companies and organizations, is that you can't just say, I'm going to increase diversity. I'm going to hire more Black people, (laughs) more Latinx and more women, and have them come into a culture in which they are not respected. Have them come into a workplace where there are small, unwelcome things that are said, and no one steps up to say that's not okay. Okay, that's the point about the bystanders. So what we do is say to employers, you can't figure out what to change until you know what's going on. And I cannot tell you how many times, like all of these companies and organizations have a great thing on their website about their principles and their values, Mm -hmm. right? And we start our cultural assessments almost each one. We have focus groups, interviews, and we start by reading out one of the principles, usually something about valuing employees and respect. And we say, does this align with your day-to-day experience? And give us examples one way or the other. 
And so long as they know that anything they say is kept confidential, which is hugely important that it's a third party coming in and we can absolutely say nothing will be attributed back to you individually. You know, unless you tell us something that might be illegal going on, in which case we do have to report back to the company. We, what you say here is confidential because we're trying to get themes about the culture. And then after that general question, we will dig in and say, do you feel respected? What are examples, ways in which you feel respected? Do you feel disrespected? Have you seen disrespectful behavior, right? So a set of questions around respect, and then a set of questions around psychological safety. Psychological safety means you feel safe to speak up. Mm -hmm. Might be to speak up about a new idea. It might be safe to speak up about a problem that you're experiencing or you see that someone else is experiencing. That's psychological safety. So, you know, it's amazing what you hear from people that folks at the top will never know. And they won't know if like they have a listening session that they put together that's all in public and then you get self-selection of the people who are coming and then they're only gonna say certain things as opposed to our assessments, we randomly choose employees from the HRIS system yeah. and then make sure that we have representation across demographics. We'll have some groups that are just all black employees, all Asian employees, all women because people will say some things in those groups that they won't say elsewhere. So that's what we do. We try to explain to employers what the situation is on the ground for them and then work with them on how to respond to what we have found. Hi, what have you seen as the more significant limitations and risk that employers face in pursuing diversity goals? Very often you'll hear employers complain, well, I don't want to be sued for reverse discrimination. If I'm giving preferential treatment to this group or that group, what about the white employees? Aren't they gonna sue me because they're not being treated the same way? So what's your response? What have you seen there? So I think we are hopefully starting to see a shift. And again, I, I credit Grace for supporting me completely in trying to change the narrative, right? Because certainly the narrative had always been from in-house counsel, management lawyers saying, oh, right, remember to tell everyone you may not take race or gender into account in any decision. Like that's what the law says. And then of course it was very hard because the lawyers would be saying that. And then the diversity and inclusion person or HR would be saying, now we want to increase our diversity and our numbers of black people. And they'd be like, hello, what am I supposed to do, right? And so part of what we've tried to develop at Morgan Lewis is, is be able to give our clients an understanding of what the guardrails are. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt under Title VII, it says you can't discriminate based on race or sex or ethnicity. So the safest thing to do is to say something like, we will never take race or sex into account. Right? That's the safest. But there is also case law from the very beginning that if you have an underutilization in a particular job category, right? If you have 30 financial advisors and they're all white men or, you know, 28 white men and two white women, and you know from statistics that you have qualified black men and women who can be financial advisors, the law is clear that if you want to create an affirmative action plan to take race or gender into account as one positive factor. It's not the preferential treatment of we're gonna hire someone who's not qualified because they're just black or woman. Let me tell you, there are tons of qualified black people and women <laughs> as there are white men. And there's many mediocre black people and women as there are mediocre men. I mean, you can find excellent folks and then have as a positive factor that the person brings diversity. Now, we make it very clear this is not a risk-free approach to do this. It's not a risk-free approach. It would mean having an affirmative action plan that is time limited, that doesn't significantly burden non-beneficiaries, 
right? Which is why you're just taking it into account as one factor among many. Um, you have to do the statistical analysis. So it's not nothing, right? It does take work, but I think we're feeling for those companies and organizations that want to move the needle, mm -hmm. taking some legal risk might well be worth it. Well, speaking of uh, moving the needle, um, I think I think this came up last summer. So Grace, I'd really like you to talk about a little bit about um, last summer because you talked you you gave us a very good view of what the aftermath and impact was after Me Too. So what about the aftermath of George Floyd? We saw in the community, like we mentioned before, demands for racial justice and reform. Uh, but what did you see in terms of working with corporations and the employers? How, what, what was their reaction like? What happened then? It, yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, just as we saw the demands in our streets and in our communities. Um, our clients and employers saw demands come forth from their employees, and especially their Black employees, whether it was walkouts, whether it was company-wide emails, whether it was on internal message board. And it, it really sort of hit corporate America um, when you'll recall after the George Floyd incidents, many companies came out with these bold statements, you know, about how terrible this was. We support racial equality. And their employees were saying, you do? <laughs> what about us internally? You know, that's bizarre that you're coming out talking about. And we saw that with a lot of our clients. And it's funny because the first reaction, and a lot of it would come from the C-suite, the, the CEO. I don't get this. Why are our employees complaining? We've had diversity and inclusion initiatives for years, right? And, and, and I'd sit there and listen and I would say, yeah, you have had diversity and inclusion initiatives, but what was really put into action as opposed to just being written on a piece of paper? It have you had discussions and a focus on racial justice? Oh, we can't talk about race. Why not? Okay. And, and it was very hard for C-suites um, to understand it. I had one client who called and it was a CEO and he was very upset because a black executive came to him following the George Floyd incident and talked about the fact that there was racial inequality within their corporation. Well, that CEO was just shocked and he called me. And the first question was, this executive came and said this to me, what's his motivation? What do you think he wants? You think he wants a big payout or something? I'm like, why does he have to have a motivation? Mm -hmm. That's being authentic and that's being sort of the lawyer, you know, that they yeah. probably don't have a discussion. Why does he have that motivation? There was silence. I said, the, the, the motivation here is we want to be treated equally. He wasn't looking to make a claim. He wasn't demanding any money. He, wanted to, he was saying to that CEO, you need to look at this organization. And I think that many of our clients got it, all right? There's some, still some who don't get it. But we've had, um, one of the things that, have, that um, has happened is we've had companies set a very aggressive goals, for example. Goals that some of them may get into trouble with, OK, but it's an effort to quickly bring more blacks and Latinx in, push them up the pipeline. And while that's good, we have to make sure that we're doing it the right way. OK, because if not, you are going to face legal challenge. But there is a real focus by many of our clients now. They understand the issues of race. A lot of companies, as I'm sure you know, they started out with conversations. You want to have safe conversations, all right? Mm 
And so there's a lot of talk about race and how people feel. And I have to remind them, it's time to stop talking. (laughs) But that was the initial reaction. The initial reaction was publicly, we support this racial justice. Second, questioning, why are our employees upset? We've had strong diversity and inclusion initiatives. Third, let's let's have conversations about race. And now, some of them then setting very aggressive goals, which we've tried to work with them on. Um, But then sitting down and trying to figure out some things that they can do to broaden their applicant pools, whether it's for promotions, whether it's for hiring, um, making sure their employees are all trained in unconscious bias and microaggressions. Um, looking at their performance evaluation systems to make sure that they're validated. Some of them getting rid of performance evaluation systems. I don't know where that's going to go, but um, and, and things in the pay equity, a bigger issue now, not just for women, but for blacks as well. So we're starting to see some change, but first denial, because I have diversity and we've had diversity inclusion for 20 years, nothing going on here. Don't understand it. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, it's the good, good thing, we're, we've, we've moved, we're moving past talk, and now hopefully we're starting to think about um, action. And I remember last year hearing people in corporate America utter the words institutional racism, and it was shocking. You know, in all these years, it's like, my God, they said the words, my word. And, and then we have these, you know, these healing circles and everybody's talking. And so now it's time for some action. And hi, I know you've written extensively about how employers have approached diversity within their organization. So what are some of the issues that they struggle with most And more importantly, how do you change culture? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right that the fact that some people now in corporations, organizations can say there is institutional racism in our society and we are not immune from it in this setting, that is huge, right? That has to be the first step because the answers have to be both structural and individual. And you're not going to make structural change if you don't understand how the structure is problematic. So for example, when people say, oh, well, I'm colorblind. I don't need, I never even see race, right? And when I do, I do trainings of employee-driven DEI councils. You know, we help them set up these councils. And I just did a training and I said, how many of you have heard that? What does it make you feel like? And like a few of the white people are like, yeah, like what's the problem? That sort of sounds good, right? You don't see, (laughs) the black people are like, hello, you're telegraphing right there, you don't see me. Because let me tell you, I've grown up in a society in which race has mattered. My race has mattered in a way that a white person's race has not. So it's, That first step of awareness is really important. And then you have to set up the structures, right? That can combat that. So for example, um, one of the things I've been most proud and happy about that I've been able to do at the firm is develop this respectful workplaces training, creating a culture of respect training, because it's not status-based per se, right? It's very skills-based on how to to speak up when there's disrespectful behavior and how to give that feedback and then how to receive that feedback. Because neither of those are natural human (laughs) capacities, especially when they're power differentials, right? And then you can do it whether it's unwelcome on something that's not status-based or unwelcome because of race or gender. I mean, the skill is the same. And having the employers say, it's important for me to have people feel safe to speak up to their coworkers, as well as to others. I'm paying money for you all to get trained in this way. That's really important. So, I mean, we also have, there's a whole roadmap, right? To creating DEI, it starts with know thyself. You have to know what your data is. 
Um, it's to engage your employees. Employees need to be part of the solution. And that's why we do these employee driven DEI councils. And then you have to have a strategy and you have to have a strategy on recruitment, on hiring, on retention and promotion. Um, you gotta have all of that. And there are things to do. I always say, just to add into that, I always say you have to be deliberate and intentional. All right. Yep. D and I doesn't happen by itself. You can have the best laid plans, but if you are not focused and deliberate on it uh, and intentional about what you're doing, it's not going to happen. And I know later on we may talk a little bit about law firms, and that's one of the things that you know I say to law firms. You know, you got to be deliberate and, and intentional. Somebody's got to make it happen, and it happens at the top, and it does. So I know we'll talk about that a little later. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to know if if either one of you could give us a real quick uh, because you've talked a lot about culture, and you've talked about you know the the need to to really you know pay attention to that focus. But truth be told, a lot of employers they approach you know issues of bias and discrimination from a very compliance oriented standpoint. And so, um, can you just Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, on that and what do you do when you encounter a um, client who really just wants to do the bare minimum? What does the law say? Let's do that. You know, I start with, um, and I don't, I'm not going to disparage in-house counsel, um, <laughs> but Linda, I know you've served in that role and I'm not going to disparage it, but a lot of times that vision or that direction of compliance is really driven by what I would call um, old-fashioned in-house counsel, seriously. Mm -hmm. And because there are many times when, you know, I've been pulled into a client to talk about diversity and inclusion. And the, you know what I hear from them? The first thing I hear is that my in-house lawyers always say no. Mm. We want to do this. And they say, no, no. And the one thing that I always say to my clients is that I'm never going to say no. I just don't. I'm going to say, I hear what you're trying to get at. Let me give you another way to think about it. All right. And what that's what we're being hired for. We're being hired to allow them to get to the end game, but in a legal way, not just no, you cannot do this. So I start with in-house counsel. I say employment in-house counsel and have to be um, more current and up to date <laughs> with the new way of thinking. And because compliance alone, and this is the, you say, how do you do it? This is what I say. I say to in-house counsel, I say it to the chief diversity officer because I'm usually sort of mediating between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> chief diversity officer and oftentimes the CEO want to do more and the general counsel and in-house you know, employment counsel say no. And it's helping the employment counsel and general counsel to understand how you can do more, right? You have to be creative, all right? And, and, and so, and you have to get away from compliance because as I say, compliance only deals with the issue that's right in front of you, the problem that is right in front of you. And if you don't deal with the larger issue like culture, that kind of problem that you're dealing with from a compliance perspective, it's just gonna happen over and over and over again. That's what compliance outlook looks like. It's gonna deal with this one thing Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to what's the bigger picture here. So that's my spiel. It may not work, but that's the spiel. <laughs> Grace, you talk about strategy. And I often think about all the innovation and ingenuity that companies put into, say, developing a new product. Right. And if you put that same kind of intention and strategy toward DEI issues, we would see the needle move. But for, you know, because of institutional racism, in my view, companies have been reluctant to really take on this issue. And it sounds as if maybe they're starting to do that now. 
starting. We're getting there. We're good. I do believe, I really do believe that the movements over the last four years, the Me Too movement and then the racial justice movement, I think is helping us to start moving to move the needle. I'm optimistic about that. That would be great. So what do you see as the biggest challenges that law firms face in their DEI efforts? And what guidance do you have for our profession in terms of how we can effectively move the needle? Yeah. So, I mean, you're right, Barbara. We, you know, our profession has not done a great job. And, and I think, again, we have to be more deliberate and intentional. It's the only way it's going to change in law firms. And what do I mean by that? Um, we are fortunate that, you know, we are the largest firm in the world with a woman as chair of the firm. And I hate to say that we, you know, it, it took a woman to get us <laughs> to where we are, but it really did. I mean, it really did because she is deliberate and intentional about things. So what do I mean by that? You come in, you look at your leaders in the firm, right? And they're all white men. Change it. You're the chair of the firm. Change it. Who are the women in the firm who can fill those spots? Who are the black lawyers in the firm who can fill those spots? There has to be a plan for getting there, okay? You've got to hold people accountable. It's the same thing as in corporate America. If, if you're saying, first of all, it's got to come from the top. That person has to say, this is going to happen or else, right? And we were fortunate in that we had that when our chair took over at our first annual partner meeting, her first meeting, she stood up in front of 800 partners and said, I want you to know DE and I is very important to me. And if you have a problem with that, come and see me. That's just how she put it. She put it out there like that. No one came to see her, okay, <laughs> about that. And in terms of holding our partners accountable, you know, the, it, how partners um, help the firm to advance DE&I is included in our compensation questionnaire, all right, that goes to the comp committee. You're supposed to identify those partners who are holding true to what we're trying to do in DE&I. We have associate upward reviews where we ask the associates you know, rank the partners that you work with on their DE&I efforts. Do they have, you know, do they build diverse teams? Do you feel included? Those types of things. Our chair reads all of those reports. And if a partner gets ranked like low on that, she is meeting with them to make that change. I have to meet with each of my partners in my group every year to talk about their upcoming year. D, E, and I is included in that. And I give them objectives on D, E, and I for our practice group in terms of mentoring, sponsoring, using, putting in front of a client, diverse lawyers. And when I come back the next year to talk with them, we go through that. What have you done? Why didn't you do this? Why? Did, so accountability is important. Being involved in the whole succession planning. I mean, you got some partners, white male partners, They've been the responsible attorney or relationship partner for 50 years. They don't even know the general counsel anymore, right? right. <laughs> they don't even know the general counsel, yet they're holding on to that credit. Management has to be involved in making sure that diverse lawyers, women, Blacks, are put in line to succeed into those um, relationships. And it's a lot of monitoring. You can't, just like we tell our clients that you have to monitor what's going on, you got to monitor your associate hours, your diverse associate hours, their workload, their, who they're working with, the clients they're getting to see. And you got to make sure that associates, especially Black associates, are getting sponsors. There have to be big rainmakers in the firm who have to be given the responsibility of sponsoring diverse associates and black associates particularly. If you don't take those deliberate and intentional steps, nothing's going to happen. So you've got to be more deliberate and intentional and the chair of the firm has to drive it. 
So sorry I went on for so long, but that's how we're going to make change. That's how we're going to make change. And that, that and that's quite a, a list that I believe if a firm took just half of those, they would see some measurable change in the positive direction. So thank you for that. Um, hi, one of the things that I'd like you to tell us is is really what are what are some of the top three things you would tell an organization that expresses an interest in taking steps to increase diversity and in an environment of inclusion, but you know they're afraid of doing something wrong. They don't know what to do. They're afraid of doing something wrong. What would be the top three things you would tell them to get started? Well, after what we just heard from Grace, I would tell them to find this recording and they could listen to that. I just <laughs> loved hearing it and, and it captured it captured what the social science tells us is important. I think we know some of this in our gut, but I think it's also helpful that there's research that says how correct this approach is, right? So first thing I would say, you have to be deliberate and intentional. Back to Barbara, what you said about you're certainly deliberate and intentional when you're creating whatever product you're creating. You're not gonna let that just sort of happen. You're gonna have a plan, right? deliberate and intentional. Two, you have to have people in leadership. I mean, Grace is so correct. I mean, Jamie McKeon, who is the chair of Morgan Lewis, and from my perspective, Grace, who's chair of the labor and employment practice, these are the two leaders that I see the most of. It makes a difference. It makes a difference, not only that they're committed to DEI, as Grace described, but that they're the ones in charge because there have to be consequences if there is not change. And that would be the third thing I would say. You've got to hold people accountable. You've got to say, when you hire new people, we want one of the job questions to be, tell me what you would do to build a diverse team. That, and you start within the job qualifications. You know, I've read any number of job descriptions and qualifications, and I've added ability to build and uh, lead diverse teams. If you have that in the job qualification and you ask it in the interview, maybe you'll get some change. And then you hold people accountable. All right. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. And I think the word that resonates with me and that I'll continue to reflect upon is the importance of being authentic. And that's important not only from an individual perspective, but from a cultural perspective as well. And so when we're talking about DEI, just keeping that in mind, the importance of being um, authentic. So I thank you so much. We thank you so much for being our guest today. I think um, one of the ingredients to success in today's workplace and even this podcast are have the ability to hear from um, individuals and experts like yourself and true authentic individuals who have lived through enough, seen, seen enough and accomplished and achieved enough to really offer up some really important insight, particularly since you know, last summer, the whole level of conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging inside of organizations has totally changed to a whole different level. I thank both of you for doing such a great job in providing some insight and giving us a real strong pathway forward. So thank you very much for joining us today. You've been listening to Today's Workplace with Barbara Johnson and Belinda Reed Shannon. If you like what you heard, click subscribe so you don't miss out on future updates and episodes. For more information about today's episode, check out todaysworkplace.com. That's T-O-D-A-Y-S-W-O-R-K-P-L-A-C-E dot com.